So Sweeper, we've been working on this since about December. Um, yeah, yeah. We started on, uh, we were talking on the phone and said, you know, here's all the, we, we like to just chat about these are the things we're seeing going on with all the different uh, customers we visit and uh, some patterns that are working and patterns that are not working. And we, uh, I'm going to cover this a little bit, but we really kind of decided, you know, we should write a paper that explains all of this uh, in terms that IT pros will understand because, you know, there's all this chatter about DevOps and the, the amount of information is just flowing so quickly now that no one has taken pause to actually reflect on if you're coming from a background that's Microsoft core infrastructure, what does all this mean to you? Uh, and, and lay it out in a language that makes sense and that's comprehensive uh, as to why it should matter to your organization. So uh, that's what we decided to tackle. So this is a presentation, uh, but we're releasing a white paper today, which I'll show you, I'll, I'll give a link to, um, that's about 50 pages long. So uh, for 20 minutes now, you guys just go ahead and read that, and then we'll listen to your comments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hopefully that it's, it's valuable to you. Uh, I suspect that this will end up being the first edition, and that we'll come back and make changes, and uh, I'll put up my information for it. So sure. before we get too far, who, who the heck are you? Well, let me pull up the next slide <laughs> with a picture of my team. So I'm Michael Green. Uh, I'm a principal program manager in Enterprise Cloud Group. Uh, I'm actually in the CAT team, and I'm the CAT PM for PowerShell and DevOps. Uh, CAT is Customer Architectures and Technologies. Uh, it has historically been our job to drive customer feedback. So we run the TAP program, uh, that kind of stuff, go out and meet with customers. I'm kind of the hunter in many ways now, so if you think about as, our, as Microsoft has become very customer focused, uh, the CAT team ends up, uh, you know, previously we were driving customer feedback, well now it's like an even more aggressive role. It's go meet with as many people as you can uh, and you know, every time you find something interesting that we need to know about, make sure that you're just funneling all of that back to the PM team. Uh, and, and we're continuing to evolve. So we, there's an Azure CAT team and an Office CAT team, and uh, more and more you see CAT teams sort of working on the very latest cutting edge of what has come out and going to customers uh, who are doing it first. And you know, being that on-site, I'm here from engineering so that when you run into things that we didn't expect, you know, there's a direct conduit uh, for those first couple of deployments uh, to help make adoption easier. So, so I, I'm, I'm from Microsoft and I'm here to help. Yeah, <laughs> I should get a van with a logo on the side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to put up my, oh, so I've been with Microsoft for 12 years. Uh, out of that, I spent from 2010 to late in 2012 uh, in operations in what was called BPAWS, now called Office 365. Uh, so. Don Jones taught me PowerShell in version one, and uh, in 2010, I uh, spent three years in operations PowerShelling everything. Uh, so I've lived a lot of the experiences that have resulted in things like what we're talking about today. So uh, I've got a lot of hands-on experience with PowerShell. If you want to contact me, uh, you're better off sending me a letter than sending me an email this week. So <laughs> if you want a response, uh, but you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I don't mind doing a little dance where we have to follow each other back and forth before we can DM each other. Um, or you're welcome to just tweet at me and, and we'll get in touch with, other, with each other. Uh, and my GitHub repo is uh, mgreengit and uh, we'll be referencing probably some stuff there. But uh, Twitter's a good way to get a hold of me. You know, when I come to this event and I walk around, for me, it's like walking amongst celebrities because, you know, I'm not really like a, a, into Hollywood celebrities, but when I look at Twitter and Slack channels and, and blogs and stuff like that, it's all of you guys that I'm reading every day. So uh, coming here and looking around at all the, the badges and seeing those names, it's like, oh, that was that guy that I see every day. And ta I've talked to him every, every week for the past 20, but I've never met him in person. You know, so uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. Great. And I'm Steve Morowski. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Chef on the community engineering team. Uh, do a bit of DSC and PowerShell and stuff for a few years. Uh, and Michael and I just kept bumping into each other a lot at, at community events and at customers and talking about these same challenges. And so um, he's like, hey, here's eight pages. I just kind of scrawled out on my thoughts on this topic and let's, let's go and do stuff. And uh, so we started collaborating back and forth, and uh, and I just kind of rode along on his coattails uh, <laughs> to uh, to help get the, get some feedback into the uh, paper and all. Uh, and 
for me, this concept is one of the most critical things as you start to move towards a more DevOps environment and workflow. Um, if you do not seriously look at addressing some of the concerns that we're going to walk through here, you will not realize all of the benefits from working with things like desired state configuration or Chef, uh, being able to, you know, you will not approach some of the uh, big wins that you see in reports like the state of DevOps and things like that, where you see these, you know, faster times to recovery and uh, reduced failure rates and things like that. And so, uh, for me, this is, uh, this is a super personal topic because this is what's gonna help make your lives better. There's a lot of learning to kind of get our heads around, a lot of different terminology, so I'm gonna get out of the way and let's, let's dive in because we got lots to cover. Yeah. So I'm gonna start with this slide because this is how big of a mind-boggling change this is. Uh, so well, I was talking about this subject with a friend and he reached up on his shelf and handed me a book. Um, I believe that's The Theory of Scientific Revolution. It's by Thomas Kuhn. But then he spoiled it for me and he told me, when you read this, all you need to get out of it is the following. And so I searched for that and read that page and then I didn't read the rest of the book, but I'm, I'm sure it's good. Um, the point is, in order for a scientific revolution to be an actual revolution, to have a paradigm shift, uh, you have to satisfy two things. There's a new set of problems. So your thing came out and it solved those problems, great. You also have to solve all the existing problems. So when a new thing comes out in the industry and we're looking at it and saying, is this something that's gonna be a huge impact? It's great, yep, all these, all these new cloud adoption and deployment type stuff, it really helps out with that. But if it doesn't help solve the, by the way, I'm gonna have servers that are not real, that I've been supporting these things for, or that model for 10 years, and I can't just do continuous deployments and knock these things over once a day. I'm gonna support them like pets, even though we wanna support everything like cattle, and that's gonna happen for a while. It has to support both, right? The paradigm shift has to make your life better for all of the scenarios in order for it to actually be a revolution. Otherwise, it's just more tools, right? So, uh, what, when I go out and, what I, the only like, universal truth I've learned in my life to this point is that there's usually not an extreme, right? Usually things sort of land uh, somewhere, somewhere more at a, a moderate place. So everything starts looking like a spectrum. If I go meet with 10 customers, I'm gonna find some that are really on the cutting edge. I'm like, oh, the whole world must be doing this. And then I'll, I'll go to the next customer. It's like, oh, no, they haven't changed at all. Uh, so as we met with people, I really found two voices. Uh, the first was, yeah, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we've been doing DevOps. So thanks for showing up and, and, and having an interest in what we're doing, because that's neat. What we've been trying to figure out is how do we bring <coughs> Windows Server into what we're doing? So, you know, we'll go meet with those customers and help figure out what their model looks like and how Windows Server can be part of that. And obviously PowerShell takes a huge role or something like that. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you meet with customers and they say, you, you explain what you just learned from the first customer. I don't know what just happened, there you go. And, uh, and they say, yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds like you're speaking a developer language and that's not really an IT pro thing. Uh, so 90 to eight, or 80 or 90% of the people are in the middle and they're just trying to keep things from falling over, right? So you can walk up and talk about, hey, there's this other way people are doing things now and it's really interesting and I think it's better. And they're like, look, I will look at making my life better after I'm done with all these things that make my life hard. Um, so I, I, that's, I love that animation. There's like three or four different versions of it. So we wrote this paper and uh, it occurred to me just a second ago that I should prescribe a hashtag uh, if anybody wants to tweet about it, you're more than welcome to. Uh, it's live as of this morning. That short code should work. It goes directly to PDF. And if you use that hashtag on Twitter, then I can search for it and I can tell my boss that lots of people were interested. So uh, I'm really excited to get that out and uh, not have to think about it anymore. <laughs> I'll leave that up if anybody else wants pictures, but it's just aka.ms slash the release pipeline model. So this slide I really put in for future presentations. Uh, we actually are going to make these slides public and then continue iterating on them so that anyone from any organization can use them. 
uh, because I feel like I need to weaponize everybody here to go back to your organization and be able to have this conversation. So I, I want to make sure that this slide deck contains the information to do that. Uh, so you probably are all familiar with configuration as code. When I say that, I'm talking about things like DSC. Um, the way that I talk about that with people who are new to the idea is that if, if you've been managing Windows servers or anything in IT, there's lots and lots and lots of APIs. So the way that you work with Active Directory is different than the way that you work with WMI and the registry and the file system and DNS and then you've got third party software and you've got hardware devices and they're all different. So the idea of configuration as code and the most simple concept is that I'm going to bring everything back to just property value. And what's happening under the hood is all being performed by scripts written by people with subject matter expertise that are trusted and have given me good tools. But at the end of the day, that file becomes my living documentation of how stuff is built. So we all hate documentation, uh, but whenever your documentation is functional, then it takes on a very different role. It's something that I had to create in order to get things where I wanted them, and now I don't have to go write the paper with the tables that explains how the server was built. Uh, so you're all familiar with DSC. Uh, I will mention, if you didn't go to other sessions that relate to this, Azure Resource Manager, I also look at that as configuration as code. Uh, in fact, most of the examples I'm going to go through today are Azure Resource Manager deployment templates. But this same model, and we'll discuss this more at the end, can apply to lots and lots of things. So any time that you see an opportunity to configure something as code and put it through a release pipeline, look at that as an opportunity. Do an investigation. Is this a way that I can make this work better? Uh, and you like to talk about this a lot, <laughs> the very last bullet. I'll, I'll just let you take ownership of the last bullet. Yeah, so uh, you know, there, there's a lot of great tooling that's being implemented in the DSC space and the ARM space. But at the end of the day, none of that makes you a subject matter expert in the things that you have to operate. So I can learn Chef. I can learn DSC. I can learn ARM. That lets me spin up a whole lot of things. But I still need to know how to operate them. I still need to know what the settings mean, what, what, what their things are. So nothing is going, nothing in this is going to replace knowledge about how these systems work. If you have in-depth Active Directory experience and knowledge, that is a major plus moving into these things. Even though we might not be clicking around in some of the familiar UIs, being able to deploy a resilient Active Directory infrastructure as configuration as code is going to lean heavily on your experience. You know, being able to understand how Windows services behave, especially in like cross-platform environments. You've got a bunch of Linux guys come over and say, hey, I want to run this thing as a service. Uh, no, you don't. That might be what you wanted to do on Linux, but you really you want to get this thing in task scheduler. Or you want to, or, or you need to create a new service that knows how to register itself and, and do some things. So you still need to have that platform knowledge. So none of that is being obviated by uh, the configuration as code space, though it may seem like it because it's kind of a simplified interface. It's you know key value, in, whether it's ARM, whether it's DSC, whether it's Chef. It's oh, I declare a resource and I give it some properties, but. Yeah, nothing will really kind of step away from and take away that core knowledge of the systems, the expert knowledge that you all have. It's, it actually becomes more and more. So these are the four things. We, when, when writing the white paper, we had to boil it down. The, and every one of these has eight things. But we wanted to get down to what are the core concepts. I'm looking at this for the first time that I can categorize this information in the, 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 to pieces I can digest one at a time. Uh, so we're gonna go through each of these and the pattern, and the paper is written in a similar fashion, is what is this and then what does this mean to me if I'm working in operations, right? Because these things all, if it, I mean, if, especially if you have in-house developers, these are things that they talk about, right? But these are not things that we normally talk about in operations. Uh, I'm not expecting you to read this slide, um, like I said, the slides would be available, and this is obvious in the paper as well. Uh, but we tried to capture what are the problems that this actually is trying to solve. Uh, so we're going to dig into these a lot. But uh, I hate just reading off the slides, so I'm not going to dig into each of those. So if we talk about source first, that's the first big bullet. What did we do before? Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe change management, uh, even though we're talking about source control. So I wanted to introduce a change. 
right? So I spin up a VM, I'm gonna prototype the change there, and then I went it and I went and I submitted a change form. Uh, and then I went to my change advisory board and I presented. You know, I've, I've tested this, I'm going to introduce a new group policy setting, I've created a VM that looks like that server, I created a sub OU, I moved the machine object into that sub OU, I applied the policy there. If, it, if all goes well, then I'm going to uh, also introduce that policy to the OU, uh, or to the policy that applies to the whole OU, uh, and I and cross my fingers that things don't explode. Um, because I don't really understand what most of these servers look like, right? Because who knows if yesterday somebody RDP'd into it and made a change. I have no idea. So I need a rabbit's foot and a change form, and I'm gonna see how this goes. Um, when we get to change advisory board, we're gonna argue, because somebody's gonna say, why do you need to make that change? It's probably gonna break my stuff. Um, we're gonna try to catch if two of us are gonna implement something that's similar, and we might, but we might bump into each other, even possibly in the same maintenance window, so that's a little scary. Uh, and then, of course, we're gonna go to the build documentation for that server and update it, because we always do that. Uh, so the first thing that happens is we don't prototype in a VM and we don't update our docs. We just show up, well, we might submit the change form, right, and then we show up and present. The next thing that happens is we're the cool kid because we're the expert, so we don't ever even submit the change form. We just walk in, throw it on our laptop and say, Saturday, I'm gonna make this change, deal with it, and that's kind of how change uh, goes, and then arguments happen, and then at the end, uh, we just present and argue, and then lastly, we just argue. And that's pretty much how change <laughs> management actually happens. <laughs> but that's what we did before. Nice. So what do we do now? We start with configuration as code. So instead of doing documentation at the end, which we never did, we just update the configuration file so that that is the documentation for how this thing is built. Um, it's also how the machine, it's how the work is performed. So if we didn't get it right, it didn't get built that way. So we know that this is right as we go. Um, included in that source control. So when I say source control, I'm talking about things like TFS. Uh, uh, we talked about subversion. Yeah, uh, Git was the one that for some reason was not landing in my head and it's the most popular one. Not, not visual sourcing. Right. Not SharePoint version. <laughs> It could be a file share. Uh, in fact, no, I talked. No, 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 no. <laughs> it should not be a file share. It is not a file share. But I will relate it this way because not it makes it a little easier it. to digest. <laughs> um, a lot of people in this room probably have a background where at some point you worked on desktops and you probably had a file share full of apps that you deployed using something to those desktops. Think about it like that, right? You had a folder structure, and you had versions of those apps, and you put them there, and with those apps, you probably had a batch file that did a silent install. We just wanna start thinking about it that way, right? So we're gonna take the way we're configuring these servers, we're gonna pair it up with a script that automatically deploys that file, uh, the pester scripts that evaluate the quality of that, and we're putting all that stuff together. And then your release of, uh, it could be a web server, it could be Active Directory Domain Controller, it could be an exchange box, whatever, you're defining a version that's yours. So that's your, like you might be working on DNS server version 7.4. And 7.4 doesn't mean that it's DNS version 7.4, it means for you, this is your 7.4 release of that part of your infrastructure. And that's kind of how we can relate source control back into this. There's a version associated with how that infrastructure is configured right now. Um, so we make the change. Uh, we're going to talk about testing in a lot more depth, but uh, you're actually going to run tests locally on your machine to say, yep, it looks like I've done this correctly. Uh, and then you're actually going to do a push. So if you're familiar with Git, uh, and even if you're using TFS, git.exe will be your front end in most cases. Um, you know, you're gonna do a clone to your machine. Uh, you can pull changes that people have made. You can uh, push your changes back. And if two teams are working on this at the same time, if somebody owns that repo, they can do a pull request. It means that they can take, you know, DNS 7.4 offline. Uh, you know, maybe they wanted to submit a change to you. They can submit change.7.5, you review it. It'll show you line by line what exactly changed. We're gonna take a look at this. Um, here's what's most important. As those things get packed in, get, get checked back in, so some people call it check-in, some people call it a push, there's metadata that happens. Who made the change? When did it happen? There's comments to explain why did that happen? 
and you can literally hold these things side by side and see, I can see right here that now, you know, we were static IP, now we're dynamic IP. Like all of these things are side by side in a window and you can see exactly when that happened. The state of DevOps survey uh, that's been going on for the past three years, the uh, fourth year of the survey is going on now. Um, Dr. Nicole uh, Forsgren has been doing a, a research on the statistics based off that survey. One of the findings that they had was that that chain argument, change control board thing there, is way less effective than source control and peer review of changes as they go out into your infrastructure. And so there, there's there's a uh, uh, there's a paper that's out there. Um, I will be blogging the link to that uh, probably later today. Uh, if you want to dive into kind of the science of it, but there is actually, there's good statistical information that shows that peer review of changes in source control is way more effective than any change control board that's out there. So I'm going to demo this first with screenshots and then I'll walk you through it. But when you go to repeat this presentation, and I hope you do, uh, I, can, I can share with you how to recreate the environment, but in case you don't have time, I want to make sure that you're armed with uh, showing people what's it look like to manage change if you're using source control. So uh, this is using TFS. This is TFS Express. So you can go to Microsoft.com, uh, look for Visual Studio under the bottom of, I think you can go to uh, VisualStudio.com, scroll to the bottom, and there's a link for TFS Express, which for five users or less is free. So uh, the, the, the environment that I'm connecting to is this environment, and it's just a TFS Express instance running in a VM on Azure. Um, like you said, GitHub is a perfectly great place to do this kind of thing. Or you know, if it's personal information or, or uh, private information to your organization, uh, you can use a private repo there. You can use GitLab, GitHub Enterprise. Uh, there's just a variety of different source control platforms out there. TFS is, is, is nice because for everything we're going to cover today, it offers it all. So it's a one-stop shop. Uh, so this is just what it looks like. That's a project that's checked in. You can see the files. You can see when the last change occurred. You can see the comments on what changed. Uh, if I go look at this in Visual Studio Code, uh, so this again is free download. Uh, you probably used it for things like DSC and uh, JSON and, and uh, other, other projects. But you can see I'm looking at making a commit. So I'm saying I'm going to retire 2008 R2 because I'm only going to support 2012 and 2012 R2 now. Uh, so I'm just removing that from my allowed values for the incoming parameters, and I'm going to check in that change. So you can see it's showing me exactly what changed. Now, that's kind of an easy one because it's just changing parameter values. Uh, it could be adding a network adapter. It could be changing the way that the network is configured. It could be adding a new virtual network. The point is that you can go see, this is what I had, uh, that I removed the line, and this is what I have now. And uh, you can do that commit. You can actually also do your push from within Visual Studio Code and a variety of different editors. You can also go out to the command line. So in this case, I made my change, but before I submit it, I'm going to run tests on my workstation because I don't want to embarrass myself by checking in a change that, that I know is going to fail. Uh, so I just invoke Pester. This is the weakest set of test scripts ever, but it's just a basic, you know, deserialize the JSON, make sure that everything I expected is there. Um, so I'm going to just run Tester, and it's going to make sure that what I'm checking in is not junk, right? That I didn't make a silly mistake along the way. And then I do a git push. Uh, in this case, it just says, yep, you modified some files, great. Uh, you own the repo, so no problem. Push them back up there. At that point, I can go look at my uh, source history in the browser. I can see, yep, I retired 2008 R2. Uh, and so if anybody ever wants to find that, it's easy to search for. And if I uh, drill into that commit, I can see once again in the browser that, yep, this is now stored forever. I can always go back and see exactly what changed when. Uh, I was logged in as TFS1, so that's who. Uh, it was Tuesday, April 5th at 5.54 p.m., so I can see when, and I can see uh, any comments I wanted to add. So the next thing that happens is build. So what did we do before? Uh, we waited after that change control meeting, right? And we came in on Saturday because we hate our personal lives. Uh, we made sure that all the servers we were going to work with are docked in RDC man so that we can remote desktop into every machine where we're going to manually make change. That was always my prep for going into the change windows. Do I have my RDC man file all set up with the password stored, stuff like that. 
Uh, so I connect to all the servers, I make changes. Then I have to do a reboot, which is where I sweat it out for you know, 30 seconds or so, uh, or four minutes if I'm waiting for BIOS to go through all the checks. Uh, hopefully I get everything in order, and then uh, after I do a little dance, for, for good luck, then I go through and manually make sure that everything still works the way that I think it should. And especially, what's that? You show us that. Uh, not, maybe uh, at the pub crawl tonight. Okay. I'll break down some <laughs> The change window tribal dance. Uh, so that last one is the scariest part, right? Validating that we didn't break something. And then if you did, it's probably a, you know, a six hour or an eight hour change window, so now the clock's running and I've got to get it fixed. But if I don't know, maybe I'm not the expert on this. I was just told that there's a zero day, so I've got to make the change. I'm, at that point, I'm just, now the clock's ticking until Monday morning, and users are gonna come in, and it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. And that's how it goes, right? That's, that's the life that we put ourselves into, week after week, or month after month. So uh, that's what we've always been doing. What do we do now? As we check in that change, uh, there's a variety of ways that this can happen, but it's gonna run the scripts, the supporting scripts that we put in there. So it's gonna start by just evaluating quality using the tests that we wrote and checked in with that configuration as code. Um, that can happen as a webhook. Uh, if, it, if it's TFS, it's all one box, so it's, it's all part of the same system. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like to turn it on. Um, other platforms have agents that monitor a source control and look for changes. You can also schedule it to happen. You can manually queue a new build. But when it says build, I mean, especially like if you took computer science courses in college, you think of build as I'm taking my source and creating an executable, like that kind of a build. Yes, that's true, but in this case, the build service is just running a PowerShell script to do these things. So build really just refers to there's a server somewhere that's going to take care of running these supporting scripts to make things happen for me. Um, so all that gets stored in source. And, and we're going to go ahead. And the reason the reason it's called a build is at the end of that process we're going to have some artifact. It may still just be a PowerShell script. It may be a module. It may be MOF files. But at the end of the day, there's there's going to be a result of that build process that we're going to move along to do some enhanced testing on or uh, to, to move into deploying in the environment. So it does map really well to the concept of build because there, uh, there will be some output or some result of that, of that process. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing that I have learned from customers is that, yes, you could go create your build server and that's the central build server for all your things. But a lot of people, when a team creates a new project, they have their own build server. And all these teams have their own build servers. They actually have configuration as code to go build a build server. And the reason for that is, uh, once everybody's doing this, why, why have downtime at releasing change just because somebody else's machine is down, that kind of stuff, right? It's just performing a function. Uh, you know, you can all have uh, the one place that you go look for source. You actually want to get to the point, and we'll talk about this in test, where that build server is doing stuff almost all the time. Um, and we'll talk about that more in test, but t think about that as you can really design this for yourself, which means you don't have to change the whole world to make this work, right? You could have this as an instance that handles just one project that you're working on. Um, this is also a really good opportunity to look at GIA, because now you're performing everything automated. So why not have a GIA, if, if number one, you're building a machine using configuration as code, well that's how you put a GIA endpoint on something. And number two, why give that machine total access? Why not have a, a run, have, why not have a, a, a set of commands or an, a, a constrained endpoint that only allows Bill to do what it needs to do and, and use that? Um, and at that point, you're delivering change using um, Build, you could have constrained endpoints for doing maintenance activities. So it's, it's not to say, I, I don't want to confuse this with, I'm only going to do this and uh, now if there's an emergency, I'm out of luck, right? So you, you do want to get to the point where you're not making random changes because then it didn't have an opportunity to go through test. Uh, but there's still gonna be maintenance activities. There's gonna be weird things that come up. You might have to go get information from boxes or uh, go check the state of things. Uh, so that's an opportunity to use things like Azure Automation, use Gia on the machine, and build out this platform. And uh, since I don't mention it later, and I don't think Joe mentioned it earlier in the week, Azure Automation can be managed using ARM. 
So you could actually check into source an ARM template that includes a script that should run and when it should run using Hybrid Runbook Worker in your environment. Uh, so you can coordinate all of these things together. We have a question. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say what you described it kind of fits in well with my experience in that you know, this is the model of what it looks like at, at the end point, right? But we're probably, you know, somewhere on the continuum or maybe at the very beginning of this, so we're not going to have all these pieces. Yeah. So as we, as we start to implement one thing, right, then we get that working right, and then we can, oh, let's, why don't we add, you know, Pester, or why don't we add, you know, Gia? And, and, and so over time, you're evolving exactly. you know, towards that, this end goal. Yes, that is exactly it. And, and, you, and you start with these things pretty much in the order in which, in which Michael's describing them. You start with source control, because that, that ends up being your single source of truth. Then you start adding your build process, and that's where you can start plugging in a bunch of other stuff like what he's going to continue talking about here. So. I'll show what build yeah. looks like, and then we'll get to the big one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you go to demo this, what we're really going to demo is, uh, and I'll do a comprehensive live demo at the end, but trigger a build, verify that things happen, look at the report. So that's, that's basically what we're going to do. Um, so in this case, this is actually the script that would run. Uh, this is formatted using Saki. Uh, in the live environment, I'm using a new version of PS Deploy uh, to replace this big code block. And so my, my live demo, it's a little bit cleaner. Uh, but if you're familiar, again, back with computer science type concepts, we heard the command make in, uh, you know, my, on a Linux environment, you might be spinning up a project from source and run make. So uh, P-S, A-K-E, pronounced Saki, but the concept is to use a DSL that's uh, similar to Make or Rake for Ruby uh, and have that in PowerShell. So uh, Saki is an awesome project to look at and it allows you to chain together a lot of really complex tasks. Uh, it's a lot to grok uh, at just a glance, but um, it's definitely a project to look at. For my build definition, which just means what are the things that are gonna happen whenever this build runs, I just have a PowerShell script, and it's going to kick off that Saki script. So I'm literally just go run that, pass it arguments, um, and the arguments are just coming from stored variables. So just like in Azure Automation, you can store assets, store variables, store credentials, things like that. Same thing. Uh, so my build literally is just run a PowerShell script. I have two steps because TFS understands how to collect published test results. So I have pester output to XML, and then this will go pick it up and make it into nice reports for me. And that's like a free bonus. Um, what, what we want to get to, and Mark Gray and I have been talking about this, we want to publish a project, um, you should really be able to sanitize this to the point where you could take that project and just make it work in any build system. It could be App Bear, it could be uh, uh, Jenkins, it could be Travis, it could be Team City, it could be Visual Studio TFS, it could be locally in your machine. You should be able to just run build.ps1 and not have to worry about it, right? You might have incoming parameters, but that's about as complex as it should need to be. Um, I just wanted to show quickly for this particular project, I've got a whole bunch of stored variables. That's just so that my scripts can become as generic as I can make them. And then uh, I really want that to be scaffolding that I can just, if I wanna go create a new project, I shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to what does that look like to check it in and have build run it and have tests run it and run a deployment. It should pretty much just be able to pass it different parameters and it should just handle it on its own. Um, and, and TFS is a good example where you can encrypt information as it's being stored. Uh, this is where for triggers, I can run it by clicking Q. If I check that box for continuous integration, then whenever I do a push, it just runs. Um, and if I click scheduled, of course, then I can set a day and a time. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm a newbie to PowerShell, but so it's part of my experience. Uh, how different is P safe from MS Build? Uh, you Very, might actually know that better than I do. Very, uh, so uh, just from a standpoint of uh, flexibility, or uh, what was the question? Uh, the difference. Uh, so the question was, what's the difference between Saki and MS Build? Um, and uh, uh, the answer is a lot and, and not very much. Yeah. <laughs> they're both they're both build descriptor languages, it, uh, but because um, it's PowerShell and not XML, it tends to be a lot more readable. Um, a lot, uh, it's it's a lot more lightweight to write and kind of dig through. Um, but out of the box, it doesn't have all the same uh, steps and things as MS Build. MS Build is really optimized for building .NET uh, or uh, you know, .NET DLLs, executables, uh, web projects, stuff like that, where uh, Saki is a little more open-ended. Um, and 
you know, just like, you know, Rake is going to be really good at, at building Ruby projects, um, and uh, Make is going to be very good for you know, your, your C projects. Uh, Saki's really nice, easy addition to uh, not only .NET projects, because you can call MS build tasks through it, but you can, um, you can also uh, easily do a lot of your PowerShell type testing, you easily get into PS Script Analyzer and Fester, because you're in PowerShell at that point. I should call out for Saki. So you see task depends. So task test depends on clean, which is, just means run a script to make sure, because this is always running over and over again in the same box, clean up anything that would have been there from the last build. And then deploy depends on test. And then uh, you know, test depends on clean. So when this runs, default depends on deploy. So if we follow this backwards, it means if your tests pass, go ahead and deploy. And that's why it's interesting to say, if you check that box for continuous integration, it means you edit the file on your machine, you hit save, type in your commit, hit push, it's gonna go to build. If all of your tests pass, you're going live. Right, so you could literally just from your workshop workstation go there. Now in most your dev environment where you're going wherever wherever that target is. Exactly. I'm like this is this is that's the most extreme that I've ever seen it. In fact I don't know of anybody that I've seen go that quickly into production. There's probably uh, are for some projects, but Yeah, I think we've we've got some customers. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> in most cases he gets the output, so in this case for DSE, maybe you've got them off and then somebody eyeballs it. Uh, what's interesting, so we'll look at PS deploy in the last section. I'll, I'll come back to that section. So I, I just want to uh, come back to that point. You said, you know, hey, that, that's kind of extreme, and you know, I don't know a lot of people that, that go all that route, but I'll bet every single one of you know somebody who's downloaded a script off of, like <laughs> TechNet or something and gone and run it in production. And that's got even fewer quality gates than what we've just demoed here. <laughs> it's true. Right? So this is more rigor than what a lot of us are currently doing today in our environments. It's very true. So uh, it's not all that crazy and... Uh, sure. So I noticed that you have the test in the beginning, right? So would you consider, like you, you talked about the fact that after I do this this deployment, right, now i got to test maybe my apps and different things like that afterwards and I'm not really seeing that as a step. Is that part of my code? Yes. In terms of my configuration code? I don't know what's going on there. But it, it's to have like, okay, here's the, you know, five applications, you know, tests that you want to do. Exactly. That's the next section. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right. But that's exactly right. Your, your head is in exactly the right place. Uh, in fact, that's the most important thing. I just wanted to show real quick, I just love this, that as you run the builds, when you click on console, there's a PowerShell window right there in your browser showing the scripts that came from source control. Um, and everything's just running right there in your browser and you can watch it and it's like, oh, this work that I did is happening somewhere. Uh, and I can do that all day long. So you might have a build fail, no problem. You can see the output, so you can go back and look uh, and you might have it send you a notification. You might just go log in the website and see it, but uh, now you can keep track of, okay, this worked on my machine. Why isn't it working somewhere else? Uh, and help troubleshoot those types of things. Uh, let's see. You also obviously can have builds succeed. Uh, you can. What's nice is when you come back and look at this later, you'll see each of the steps where it went and got from source, it ran Saki, and then it published test results. So you can double click on those and actually see the full log <coughs> output in the history of all these builds. I was gonna say, I think I got a screenshot of that. Yep, so if I go look at, there's the history of my builds, and then we get the test. So uh, everything that has happened in this environment, you can go back and see what it was. So testing, what do we do before? Create our VM, install the OS, probably installed an app uh, or, or built a service of some kind. Um, we try the change. Um, could be manually, could be, yep, yeah, sure. I got I on that last part. Yeah. I kind of use, use AppNator for my CI. Yep. One of my biggest issues is trying to get AppNator to work. So I end up doing 48 builds just trying to get the AppNator configuration to work. Yes. Um, is there a way to? Um, 
most source control or most build type environments have a way to expire out history because it's a database somewhere and it, you may not care about it forever. Um, in this case, I think I've had it set to like 10 days or something. So I noticed when I logged in last night that these builds from last week when I was playing around, which I had like an embarrassing number of failed builds because I was just banging on it and banging on it. Um, but it does, you can do that or you can keep them forever. It's, it's configurable. But uh, I knew exactly what you just described, which is I think I got everything right. And then I have to figure out how to make everything work in this other environment that is generic. But it actually leads to me having better quality in the end and solving more interesting problems. But I, there's a lot of lessons learned as you go. I mean, for the app like I don't, I don't have a way to get my hands into like their, you know what I mean? Their yep. are spinning up. So I mean, my last recent one was all of a sudden, uh, yeah, I just couldn't install a module from the gallery. Anymore. So I was like, yeah, the new bit, whatever, wasn't up to date. And yep. you know, I spend all my time trying to troubleshoot. There is a way, by the way, for App Bear that you can inject a stop in the remote desktop into their, yeah, but we can talk about that. So as part of our build tasks, one of the steps that we do before we do any deployments is uh, do a security audit, like scan through the code, and if you see any third party awesome. applications that are components that are vulnerable. Uh, so we have one, we use some components, but I would like to get some feedback on that. Do you guys, any, do you guys prefer any specific tool? We use OASP as part of the Jenkins plugin, and we yeah. do a dependency validation. So, Go for it. yeah, um, so uh, <laughs> you can definitely inject all sorts of security testing into this pipeline. This is just giving you different points to, uh, at which you can inject various test phases, right? One, one, so one of the things is with build, we end up with an artifact. And, and Build is usually on like a per project basis. So it might be how I manage my AV servers. It might be a particular application. But at some point, these things come together in like a test environment to where we can prove these things out. And that's where our configuration management and our applications kind of all land together. And that's the environment that we want to do that uh, a lot of that uh, security testing and, and things. Um, in the Chef ecosystem, we actually push that way earlier with Chef compliance. Uh, and, and inspect where you can do that uh, security and, and uh, compliance testing as part of the whole dev process all the way up through the cycle. Um, but where, where you get into a lot of the, you know, we're going to test how this looks deployed on a test server, you know, maybe do some fuzzing of URLs and all that kind of fun stuff. That's going to happen kind of after you get your artifact built and deployed into some kind of staging environment. And so that's, that's where we start coming into uh, right after Michael gets through, kind of. There he goes. All right. We should get the accelerator, too. Yep. So. Yeah, we've we're, we're, we're got five. Yeah, that's not, so. yeah, uh, not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to shortcut this, your bill's going to run all the, the, the tests that you stored in source control. Um, we're lucky that we're running PowerShell because Script Analyzer is out there. It's a whole just volume of rules that you can get for free. And it runs from the command line, and you can automate it. So that works out really, really well. Um, and then you go off there, pester. Uh, if in the next, if you're over there for the next time. Yeah, uh, I think two o'clock. Okay, because yeah. he can show you what kitchen looks like. So you can think about uh, test kitchen from Chef working together in this environment with PowerShell with pester. But what if for this change you actually need to test it against 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2? Not that anybody would have diversity of machines across their environment to deal with something like that. But that would make doing that, again, back to just an, a property value. What platforms? These three. OK, cool. And then it's just going to go run those tests, spin up a VM on whatever you want to spin up a VM on, run these tests, save the results, go to the next thing. So all of these tools are all about making complicated things simple. Uh, and then definitely go look at uh, OVF, operational validation. It's under. Uh, github.com slash PowerShell slash operational validation framework, I think. Github.com slash PowerShell and you'll find it. But it's a, uh, a project that's being spun up around uh, how do you know that after you've deployed the change that everything still works. Uh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, and unfortunately this is kind of what we're, we're getting down to the wire time-wise, but this test phase, source control and this test phase uh, when, when they did the statistical analysis of all the parts of continuous delivery and what adds the most value, it's source control and all of the, and, and, and the integrated testing and automated testing. So the more effort you put into 
focusing on source control and the, and all of the automated testing capabilities, those are going to deliver your biggest bang for your buck as you start to adopt more continuous delivery type practices. Um, and, and it's been proven out that that's definitely been a thing in the Chef ecosystem. Um, we are super heavy on the testing side of things because it delivers such great value. So um, definitely spend the time looking at all the different test tools. Yeah, I always tell people if there's one skill in 2016 that I would go learn, it's pester. Because you're going to be equipped for everything that comes at you after that. Um, so if you only have time to go learn one new thing, pester is just hugely valuable. Uh, TFS is nice because it goes and picks up those results. It works because pester can output into an XML format that's an industry standard for NuNet. Um, so it just picks up those and brings them in. I didn't have to do anything to make this reporting work. So it can say, uh, yeah, for each of those builds, here's your test history, it all worked. You can obviously see if I had a thousand tests instead of four, that this would be really valuable. There's lots of charts down that side. I can drill in, I can see the results of any one test, uh, and then I can create bugs. So I can say, Steve, you checked in junk. Here's a bug back to you that uh, this doesn't work right. So that never that's happened. all for free. Uh, so I'm skimming fast. Release is interesting because uh, it's the most exciting thing to me, but it's the least interesting part of the demo. Uh, so it's where I've been putting all of my thoughts lately, uh, but as far as the demo is concerned, if you're running this, it, something got released, so it's not that exciting. Um, but you know, basically, it's gonna, something's going to go create the environment if needed. Um, if, the server, if it doesn't already exist, it's going to uh, manage any changes. So as part of build, you might have in that script go out and configure a load balancer, or go create a new volume on the sand, something like that, right? So um, any environmental changes happen there. Uh, what we did before, obviously, was go do through all these things manually. And that would include, now that I've built this machine, I'm going to go to Windows Update and get it fully patched. I'm going to make sure that anti-malware is there. Uh, I'm going to onboard into our backup and monitoring services, all of those. It's why it took us three weeks instead of three minutes, uh, because we did all those things manually. And then we announce a go live, right? Which is, again, where we get gray hair. Um, so what do we do now? Build again, just that's another thing that it takes care of. Um, so everything that we need to do to make that release happen is stored in our deployment script in that source control. And it's tested using Pester. We've tested it locally from our workstation. Uh, as part of the build server doing things, you might have multiple environments so you might actually do a release to a quality, a quality assurance environment, and then that's it for the automated build, and then you go back and trigger something else that goes into production. Um, I've seen a variety of things go through this. Uh, that's what we talked about promoting through stages. You might have a, cut a cutover scenario where you have a green-blue, and you use a load balancer. So we're going to deploy to green, and then flip from blue to green, things like that. Um, just to do a quick demo since we're now out of time. Uh, I'm a huge, a huge fan of PS Deploy. Uh, so Warren is here. I think this project is absolutely awesome. And so uh, we've been working together on, he's just a champion with PowerShell and has been making some interesting changes to make it work like uh, Pester and uh, Saki so that all of this is just one cohesive story. Um, but I contributed an ARM plugin so that it could work with this. Uh, which I, uh, I think I broke last night, so my demo fails at this step. But uh, you can see it's the same concept, right? Deploy using ARM from that template to that resource group. You can do tagging. So your tag might be production versus QA, which means it would just be a variable that you could use uh, from your deploy to say, I'm going to just set this for QA and then tell PS deploy, go run all the de deployments that are tagged for QA or uh, you know, that are tagged for dev or that are tagged for project name or whatever. Uh, one of the things I can't wait to try is use this because you can have these things depend on each other and have Azure and Azure Stack deployments tied together. So I'm going to release a service onto Azure Stack, but I'm also going to have it go create an Azure automation account put my modules and configurations there, and then bootstrap those machines to Azure and do a one-stop hybrid deployment. Uh, I can't wait to prototype that. I, I, all of these tools make those really complex, mind-boggling you know, new things very easy. And I can now take the lessons I've learned in the past and bring them forward. So uh, just to start wrapping up, these are the, since we're, since we're at PowerShell Summit, Learn Pester, learn Saki, learn PS Deploy, go take a look at OVF. As you get further down the line, there are so many DevOps tools. 
Uh, so as, as we update this slide, we'll continue growing this list. Um, and in the white paper, we actually call out a wide variety. So. Yeah, and one thing, um, I have a session on uh, essential skills for a DevOps world or something to that effect uh, <laughs> later this afternoon. Michael's gonna come join as well. So uh, one of the things we're gonna talk about is build pipelines and the importance of, the, of continuous delivery and testing and all that. So we can definitely have more time to dive into some of these concepts. Uh, I will make this probably my last so slide. Yep. Um, this is a huge point, so I just wanna land, land this uh, before we leave. Yep. Coming from an infrastructure background, it's in our nature to say, I found a new thing, this is my thing now, and I'm gonna focus on that. And there's a couple of things that make this type of platform work. One is you gotta get buy-in, right, from others in your org. You can't do this alone because it only works if everyone agrees that the tests have to pass before we move forward. Uh, the other is keep your options open. So in the paper, we talk about things like how do you use this together with Config Man and what's it look like to use this together with group policy because you're not gonna cut this over overnight. And it's your job as, you know, you are, the people, right? You're, you're the people in your organization that they look to as the lead architect that says, how do we do this, smart guy, right? And the answer is, it's not going to be a, okay, well, I stopped using this tool, and now I'm using this tool, and now we're a lot better, right? That's just a tool change. It's a process change that makes this so valuable. Uh, so we don't want to look like this with the precious. <laughs> And now I've got my build server, and now I'm just linked to this. That's all I care about now. <laughs> nope, you still got all the tools you had before. It's a process change, and you can bring all these things forward, and that's how you be the hero for your organization and help them get into this new world. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, applying this same model to everything and making it visible, and uh, it might be a success. So we'll continue on to such that. So, thank you. Can you put the resource page back up?